With the midterms now just 11 days away, we are seeing extraordinary challenges to our democracy across the country. With our 45th president, Donald Trump, inspiring an unprecedented denial of the legitimacy of the 2020 outcome, and armed vigilantes in tactical gear intimidating voters in Arizona, our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, led a country that was then deeply divided, devolving into civil war. So what can we learn from him about demonstrating political courage to keep the union together in a polarized time? Well, joining me now is Pulitzer Prize-winning presidential biographer John Meacham, who occasionally advises President Biden. And his new book is already number two on the New York Times bestsellers list, entitled, And There Was Light, Abraham Lincoln and the American Struggle. John, it is so good to see you. You too. Um, you are such a reassuring presence <laughs> with your historical context and with your understanding of political courage, mm. the role of faith, how people can be moral, how they can make compromises like Abraham Lincoln did, but still come out in the right place in pulling people together. Um, Without a moral commitment to something larger than your own perpetuation in power, the American Republic doesn't work. And Abraham Lincoln wasn't perfect. We're not perfect. You're closer than I am, but uh, the hard <laughs> but the, the, the essence of America at its best is a devotion to the principles of the Declaration of Independence. And the Constitution, you know, the Declaration of Independence is our mission statement. The Constitution is our user's guide. And standing right over there on March 4th, Saturday, March 4th, 1865, Abraham Lincoln stood there and talked about, with malice toward none, with charity for all, let us bind up the nation's wounds. The war had come, however, because he was convinced that slavery had to die and democracy had to endure. And so in our own time, we have to do a, to use a popular term, we have to do an inventory. We have to decide, what do we really believe? Do, are we so wedded to a partisan agenda in real time that we're, we just want our way right now? Or are just enough of us able to say, you know what, I may not agree with uh, the Democrats in this case on policy, but you know what, democracy is more important than a marginal tax rate. We've got right now 345 election deniers yeah. on the ballot across the country in key positions, secretary of state, governors, people who control election outcomes, according to Brookings. So how confident can we be? Let's say all of those people win their races and, you know, it collapses. Yeah. How confident can we be that democracy does survive? We can't. We can't be confident. We have to work really, really hard. Um, this is the gravest test of citizenship since the Civil War. And it's, this is, as President Biden might say, it's not hyperbole and it's not a joke. It, I thought for a long time, you and I talked about it a lot, that this was either 1932, 33, or 1968, where the institutions ultimately held. The difference is Herbert Hoover didn't say FDR stole the election and put election deniers on the ballot in 1934. Hubert Humphrey didn't do that in 1968. President Trump, former President Trump has done that. And to a large extent, he is both a mirror and a maker of this paranoia, which is what it is. It's, it's fact free. And I think one of, the, one of the groups that really has a moral reckoning to do are people who disagree with President Biden and Speaker Pelosi, whom we're thinking about at this hour, and the Democratic Party on policy, who say they don't appreciate Trump, but who nevertheless vote Republican because of judges and taxes and, and that sort of thing. All important, of course. But as our friend Doris Goodwin pointed out, quoting Eleanor Roosevelt, this is not an ordinary time. And... When, it, when you reference Paul Pelosi, I know Paul Pelosi. I've known the speaker. I've known both of them for decades. I interviewed her right after January 6th, where she talked about the terror that her young staff was experiencing under the desk, under the table. And we saw the video of people going up and down the hallway. And now we understand that this intruder, who 
in a violent attack from all the information we're now getting, and we're waiting for the police, they may be a little bit delayed, and, but we will carry it live when they come out with their report. He was shouting, where is Nancy? Where is Nancy? So this is a federal crime. Yeah. He was after the Speaker of the House. Yeah. It's... Uh, I'm lucky enough, both Paul and the Speaker are friends, so take this in that context. Uh, I think they embody public service and love of country. I really do. I, um, I don't agree with the Speaker on a lot of policy matters, but I don't doubt that she loves this country uh, deeply. Uh, Paul is a remarkably supportive spouse um, and all shares that love of, of, of country. And one of the marks of the end of a republic is the normalization of political violence. It just is. And everybody needs to remember, including us, that what we say matters that words have consequences, and that things that seem improbable one hour can happen in the next. And if I, if I had brought you Lee Harvey Oswald on, March, on November 21st, 1963, he said, this guy's going to change American history, you would have said, oh, you're hyperbolic, you're, you're being great. You're paranoid. You're paranoid. James Earl Ray. Uh, violent acts can change history. And a mature democratic society, lowercase d, has to have a way where we mediate our political differences without political violence. You know, January 6th has, despite all the hearings and all the evidence, it's retreated as a politically, uh, as a, a motivating issue for voters. But here you've got the example of Liz Cheney, one of the only examples we've seen in modern mm -hmm. political times, who stood up at the risk of her own future was then banned from the leadership, ran unsuccessfully, and is now endorsing and voting for the first time for a Democrat, Alyssa Slotkin, in Michigan. She's the model of this. And I disagree with Representative Cheney on a lot of policy. Um, but she has put the Constitution above all. She has put an experiment toward a more perfect union above her own political interests. That is the definition of political courage. That was the book that President Kennedy wrote. And, you know, it's, it's an old joke that Profiles in Courage is not very long and one volume. But we need to make room for Liz Cheney. With malice towards all. Well, malice towards... Malice toward none. Malice toward none. Charity for all. Charity for all. My gosh, how could I get that quote wrong? It's well, a sign of the times. Yeah. It's, a, you know, it's... You've done this... We've both done this a long time. And I think both of us... I don't want to speak for you, so correct me. Didn't think we'd see this. Oh, not at all. Where the institutions themselves would give way. And the good news is, it's up to us. And the bad news is, it's up to us. John Meacham, your perspective is, you know, so valued. The, the biographer of George Herbert Walker Bush, which is such a fantastic and eulogist for him, his example is top of mind as well. Of all the presidents that you've written about. Absolutely. It's, uh, imagine a world. I mean, it's, it's as if we're talking about the Peloponnesian War, George H.W. Bush, a, a president <laughs> who put country above party, although Liz Cheney has done that. And so that should give us some hope. John Meacham, thank you so much. Thanks, Andrew.